Ready to beam up, Jim. Energizing. All right, you mutinous, disloyal, computerized half-breed. We'll see about you deserting my ship. The Ken's Laser. Welcome, everyone, to the next episode of Occam's Laser. So today we're going to talk about tele... <laughs> today we're going to talk about transport. Teleportation. Tra- trans- transportation, yeah. Teller transportation. So, in 1984, Derek Parfit, um, philosopher, introduced this concept of a thought experiment on the topic of a teletransporter. Um, and so, to begin, I suppose, to just run through his argument that he gave in the book, and then we can lay into it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so imagine this. There's a machine on Earth that puts you to sleep, then it destroys you, um, it breaks you down into atoms, and it copies all the information in your atoms and sends that to Mars at the speed of light. Then on Mars, another machine um, rebuilds you from atoms there exactly the same as you were before. So his central question is, is this copy of you that's on Mars Does this represent a method of travel? So like the person on Mars is the same person as you? Or is the person who woke up on Mars not you and they're just basically another person? Um, The easiest analogy is that this is what's used in Star Trek. So beam me up Scotty when they're on a planet and they like get vaporized and then recreated (laughs) on the on the ship that they're they're there and in Star Trek and kind of in movies and stuff, it's always presented that you're the same per- person. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think we are. What do you think? Um, uh, I don't know. I don't... Who is this perfect guy anyway? He was, <laughs> <laughs> he was the first person to, to transport himself to Mars. And back. <laughs> yeah, so... And then he's a completely different person. <laughs> Yeah, so 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 he, but even in the 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 Star Trek case, um, mm-hmm. it's a glaring plot hole that they're the he, same person because it's essentially murder, <laughs> and you're just waking up. Um, so the the analogy that makes it, it crystal clear that it's not the same person because when you step in and into it into a transportation machine and then you're um vaporized and appear somewhere else as soon as they introduce a delay in it so if it didn't vaporize you instantly but instead Mm -hmm. you just walked out of the machine and someone on mars was created who was exactly like you then you would have no doubts that you know that you're still you yeah and then they like someone comes out and hits you in the head with an axe (laughs) yeah it's like you're not supposed to be here (laughs) Yeah, yeah um yeah, I mean, that's where the real flaw comes in, is when... See, the whole, like, part... The whole argument of it not disassembling you and you just coming back out of the machine, I don't really like that because that's what the machine does, right? <laughs> you can't just yeah. change how the machine works. Um, but if you do induce a delay, then it's very weird. Like, what happens for that delay? Yeah, I suppose all it is is though that the the it's yeah it's more of a copy machine. Like to say it, it reconstitutes you isn't true because it's not it, they're not the same atoms. Not that it would really matter if they were, but if you the person who then exists on Mars or whatever has your memories and stuff. Yeah, like they, well, they would the, remember. They they would say, "Hey, I just stepped into the machine and now I'm on Mars." Yeah, for, yeah, it would just be teleportation for those people. Yeah, for the new you. But I mean, there's so yeah, it gets very very complicated. But I think it's interesting to look at it as well, just from like the physics side of things, because this is kind of where I end up looking at this and then going down the physics route, which 
is probably going to be the case nearly all of the time, but... <laughs> but that's better, as philosophers talk about these thought experiments, you know, abstractly, but it, then, I guess, if you just study the physics, then, well, you know... I yeah, it's kind of like, well, does this, will this ever actually apply in real life, or is it just a thought experiment to make people freak out about the idea of who you are yourself? <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, basically... I found uh, there's some like good videos on on this topic on YouTube, but um, I found that there's basically in physics three ways of teleporting things. Um, so one way to teleport something would be if it just if you got say say you were standing on Earth somewhere, and you fell through some rifted space time somehow and appeared somewhere else. Um, and there's no really known way that that can occur in physics. That's just like the the idea that that could happen. Uh, so I guess the equivalent of that in um, uh, sci-fi would be like a wormhole or something like that. Yeah. Um, but there's no evidence for those really existing. Um, there's some theoretical, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they're not impossible through like, maths, but that doesn't mean that they exist. So... Then the second one, second way to teleport somebody is to disassemble them and send that dis- disassembled person to a new location. So but if it, I... In the information way rather than in the atoms, because it doesn't really matter, you know, if you use... So, yeah, I mean, you could do it with the atoms. And this kind of differentiates it from the third way, which is where you basically just uh, scan somebody and disassemble them, but just send the information... But you could just send the atoms, right? If you had like a high speed way of getting somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but the problem, the problem with, um, so the second way has the limitation of you have to be able to send it as fast as you want, and then you get into the whole issue of that delay again. But there's um, the irony of if if they're sending the same atoms, so like you know, they disassemble you into atoms, put you on a, a bus, and send the bus and reassemble you. It's like. Yeah, they exactly. I just yeah. get on the bus. <laughs> yeah. So I imagine Please. getting disassembled into atoms is quite painful. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're dead then as well. Yeah, I, like yeah. if even if you're reassembled, I mean, do you remember being disassembled? Uh, like, because if you just remake somebody from new particles, I feel like they would be less likely to remember being disassembled. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we made someone, like if we made... Uh, Genghis Khan or something out of we found the atoms he was made of and joined them back together now you know he, <laughs> he would be like what the fuck obviously <laughs> yeah so abstract <laughs> I don't even know how that would work um, so yeah then I guess um, basically the third way is the most physically feasible so you scan somebody's um essentially just scan their information like how many atoms they're made of where the locations of all of those atoms and even down to like a quantum level so like spins of uh, electrons and the like super superposition of states and all of that um and it's actually that's been done with like photons and electrons and some atoms as well i believe but so that's cool but if you did if you didn't copy the exact spin states then it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't actually be teleportation. It would just be a bad, co- like, it would actually be a different person, you know. Like, if everything wasn't identical, like, this only, it only really works if everything is, otherwise it's just a bad photocopier, kind of. Yeah, because I think if you, if you try and copy everything exactly, like an absolute perfect copy, mm-hmm. uh, you run into quantum mechanics problems of stuff like that, no cloning theorem. Um, yeah. that we mentioned before um but so you could but but it is possible to do it um it just means that you have to destroy the thing originally so in the original scenario you were saying like where you get into machine and you're destroyed and then reappear on mars yeah um you have to be destroyed physically it's yeah. impossible for you not to be destroyed Oh, because that, yeah, and that's what the no cloning theorem says. Yeah, basically. Um, and obviously, it's kind of like that just works for cloning something in the same location, but it also applies if you're teleporting something. It's just impossible 
by the laws of quantum mechanics for you to have uh, an object and some material and make a clone of that object without destroying the original. Well, maybe they could just like send every time they send you to Mars, they just have to give you like a bigger dick or something. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that would is that sufficiently different for (laughs) quantum mechanics? Do you think quantum mechanics would be okay with that? I don't know. (laughs) But actually, like this all sounds like incredibly sci-fi, and you know, more of an art. Like I think that's why people go into the philosophy debate because it's it just doesn't sound practical on the scale of both. But um, do you know that physicist uh, Michio Kaku? It's a, uh, he he's like a um, popular physicist. He writes books about outlandish things that are impossible. He's cool though. But he said in uh, 2008, um, he predicted, should I say, uh, in the Discovery Channel magazine that a teleportation device similar to those used in Star Trek would be invented within 100 years, which is That's just ambitious. A, a outrageous claim. Um, as somebody yeah, called I mean, it, though, the, 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 so students at the University of Leicester then went and just did the maths on how much energy it would require to beam somebody up. Um, and it said <laughs> that to beam up just the genetic information of a single human cell, not the positions of the atoms, just the gene sequences uh, together with a brain state would take... 4,850 trillion years, <laughs> assuming that 30 uh, gigahertz microwave bandwidth. But it's just like, it's just crazy. <laughs> like, you know, the, all these things that are physically possible can still be so, like the conditions, you know, might not yeah. ever exist in the... Yeah, they're still very constrictive. Like, <laughs> you're not going to be able to actually send so many. I can send a couple of calcium atoms, but I'm not going to be able to send my brain. <laughs> But then if you yeah, but if you were talking to someone um a, a thousand years ago like sending um an email or like a pdf to someone and then printing it out on the other side of the world would probably be as amazing that you know or digital yeah i mean it's kind of that that was probably the equivalent back then i guess um and and that is like crazy like if you brought somebody from back then into today's email based society they'd be so shocked <laughs> and how much time people waste sending emails <laughs> yeah, yeah. cuz emails I, I learned recently even spam emails have a, a quite a large carbon footprint from the electricity that just people spend looking at them and to to move the information around and stuff and there's something like 96 trillion um or billion no, definitely a billion like spam email sent every some period of time. I can't remember the fact at all, but a big number. Um, yeah, because like the amount of energy probably per email is quite minuscule, but it's just that there's billions of spam emails constantly being sent. Yeah, and farms and stuff. Uh, and it's so it's such a waste of like energy in general. Like even the people that have to host those emails, like it's uh, it's such yeah. a waste of everything, <laughs> time and yeah. energy. Well, yeah, I mean, human time spent doing that when they could be doing anything else. Like, I mean, people who set up spam. Like, Bots. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the thing with the transporter is, I mean, so to say, if they send it between Earth and Mars, like, that's a spatial difference. But if they, I mean, so like we are saying, reconstituting someone from the dead, I mean, you could do it temporarily as well. So instead of, you would just, like, make it, you know, a copy of them wait a while and then remake them like if you're like oh i really want to visit the year 3000 or whatever yeah that would be weird <laughs> i did I, did, I didn't actually think about that aspect of it at all but that's basically just like time traveling but not really <laughs> it's like yeah, getting it's a kind of cheat back. code to get around it did um but you can only go forward yeah which, which is, is the kind worst of the <laughs> but did uh, you read about wormholes before, didn't you? And you you're saying that they're they're also possible in theory, but just that the like they co- the would be so of them of, of <laughs> collapsing that they would just collapse if soon as you sent through a whiff of a breeze. Yeah. So basically, uh, there's like multiple different types of wormholes, in that they don't actually know if any of them would work, but they're theoretically, it's like, oh, this could be a wormhole. And like one of them is like a black hole, but then that practically becomes impossible because there's a singularity at the center. So 
if you go into a black hole apart from being ripped to shreds you would like um just freeze in time and never actually come out the other side um oh, shit but then there is the poss- there's uh definitely some work was done on like how you could make wormholes like human made wormholes uh but the amount of energy that they take uh, to create and also keep open is absolutely insane. It's like more than the amount of energy that the that humans have ever produced or something. So, yeah, I guess a bit exponential growth. You know, give it a few. <laughs> yeah, not even million years, uh, hundred years. Because again, <laughs> if you went back two thousand years ago, they were like the energy required to send one email is more energy than humans have ever produced. <laughs> that is true. We should look up. Uh, what the projections for energy production and consumption of the human race are on the on the time scale of billions of years or <laughs> even hundreds of years we should yeah. do we should do an episode on energy usage that would be good yeah yeah uh yeah nuclear and such um right so here's a question for you if if you were given the option of well would you get in the transporter anyway no if you're uh, like oh, Mars. Elon Musk sent, set up a Mars base. You can go there in eight months on the ship, or you can just step into this transporter. Knowing that it was going to deconstitute me and recreate me on Mars. Yes. Like as in knowing that myself would die and then be reborn magically, not as me, but as someone else. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. If it's painless, I mean, I don't really have an issue with it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, that's the thing like it is still it is still death but if you were given yeah, the option of say, if you were if you could you know die in a painless way or you could um you're super old right you could die in a painless way or you could step in a transporter and um it's much more painful like getting very prized is actually really sore but then you had the knowledge that somewhere in the galaxy somebody is walking out of a machine who thinks they're you i mean like would that give you any would that help you sleep better or would you still be like now nah, i'll take the painless way because i don't care about that other person who thinks they're me yeah i think i'd take the painless way i mean i don't see any reason not to <laughs> yeah because they're they're not you at all but the only thing is if there was well, when i was asleep they like people cloned my genetics or whatever and made a copy of me on mars and then I knew there was like a version of me going around on Mars living his life and he um, he was like homeless or something. I would definitely feel obliged morally to give him <laughs> some money. <laughs> Cause you're, maybe he's just like, you know, representing you badly. <laughs> you just feel yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, come on, get your act like, together. <laughs> tarnishing my good name. That, At least I took all the good hashtags and stuff on Twitter. So he'll be. <laughs> well, he could but, name himself something else, I guess. Yeah, but but so I suppose we would diverge instantly as soon as he's created. Then then we're different people. Then because then we have different experiences. Yeah. So it's only instantaneously. Um, but the you know, like it's actually quite like there's a lot of overlap I think with AI and those like movies like Ex Machina, where yeah. there's a robot created that's your mind uploaded into a machine because it, I mean it's effectively the same. It's just a different. Mm-hmm. Substrate. Yeah, you're basically just killing yourself and then there's a machine version of you that thinks it's you. It's the exact same thing as far as we're concerned uh, because we don't really know how any of that would work. But yeah, um, something though that relates to what you're saying about like, oh, would you actually go and um, go into one of these machines knowing that you're essentially just killing yourself? Um, it's interesting to, you know, that uh, idea of the... Um, what's called the the ship of Theseus, the, yes. where you have a ship and like you you replace parts of it over time, and then eventually the entire thing's been replaced. Is it still the same ship or not? Mm. Like that's happening with our bodies all the time, right? Your cells are like breaking down. You're you know taking in carbon. You know you're basically replacing all of your cells constantly. Um, yeah. And it's something I mean, like after a year that your entire skin cells have been replaced, so none of your skin is the same skin from like a year ago. Yeah, and I, but I think your entire body is only like a decade or something. Um, yeah, so what is what, like that kind of, if you're okay with that happening, and we are, then why wouldn't you be okay with it happening the other way, just instantaneously? 
Well, okay, yeah. So there's there's a few things here. So look, first of all, then we there's 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 the boundaries to a person is actually really loose. Like if you zoom in on it, like mm -hmm. on a microscopic scale, like the boundary between me and the chair I'm sitting on, there is no clear boundary. You know, they're both just atoms who are just bouncing off. Um, and I'm taking up some chair atoms, and I'm probably giving back some. <laughs> Lay, laying some trouser down there. No, I'm not wearing any pants. pants <laughs> <laughs> no more lousy pajamas. Uh, <laughs> but the the thing is, I'm more like like I have so little than in relation to who I was like ten years ago in terms of like thought patterns as well, and that like my brain was a different size, my body was a different size. Like I also had a different amount of atoms in me and different atoms that mm -hmm. like over time identity changes probably more within one person than between people. So like I would say you are more me, like a higher percentage of you is me now than a higher percentage of me when I was like 12, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I do know. <laughs> It's just that, like, I mean, how I, how identity kind of continues on. Like, there's no, there's, there's no, I mean, it's the same with the ship of thesis. Thesis? Thesis, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it just kind of is weird to think that that idea of yourself and the self is kind of, like, we don't really know. <laughs> it's just very vague. Like, it kind of goes back to, where that comes from like physically is it where all of your electrons are in your brain at that time is that who you are or is it just some weird emergence of complexity that comes from having a load of atoms moving in that particular way like it, nobody really knows or anything so but this it's is kind of hard to pin it down buddhists are always banging on about like there's no like to, to say like something is a ship or a car it's just a useful uh, approximation and um, um, t to give that group of things but like yeah at, when you get down to it like there is no such thing as like carness like it, it's just more shipness mm -hmm. it's just yeah it's all just the same it's just more atoms <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah not only that but like nearly all the same kind of atoms like it's all just pretty much carbon and a bit of hydrogen um yeah. So another thing that this reminded me of when I was reading about it was that film. I don't know if you saw it. It's not very good, particularly, but uh, The Prestige. Have oh, you seen that? I think it's a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I sorry. Say, I'd say it's it's nine out of ten. No, eight now. Okay, well, maybe I just have to rewatch it then because I haven't seen it in like maybe six years, seven years. Who knows? Get it? <laughs> uh, no, I think well, I yes. got it. <laughs> Let's see what it is on yeah, IMDb. It kind of that will be the, it that knows who's wrong and who's right. <laughs> yes, because the critics at IMDb are. Oh my god, it has eight and a half. Nailed it. That's a pretty good guess. Well done. Um. But this is kind of the it deals with the same sort of themes and uh, issues in in the sense that like <laughs> he goes off uh, for some reason uh, Tesla has a cloning machine which who that knows how that happened as as everybody expected him to have in his basement um, and that's why he's probably still alive somewhere um, <laughs> but yeah it's just very funny that like. He goes off and starts cloning himself and killing himself every time. And uh, your man's like, what? No, I just had a twin. <laughs> yeah, so every night he kills himself. Like he just commits suicide because for the sake mm. of his show. But uh, not so I, spoiler alert. Anyway, but but it, the most unrealis unrealistic bit is like you would never do it. You wouldn't get in once. No, because this is the thing going back to like if you got in the machine to send you to Mars, if it's painless and you essentially just disappear... That's a lot easier than drowning yourself every night. Yeah. Like, well, that's just insane. That man's yeah. not well. <laughs> and, if you, and, yeah, and to be told that, oh, someone will come out to your side and collect a paycheck, then I'd be like, I don't care. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not going to drown like that. That's such a horrific way to die. <laughs> yeah. We just sit down and like get like uh, euthanasia and be nice and comfortable or something. <laughs> <laughs> if he's going to do it, do it right. Um, but yeah. I don't know if... I mean, definitely, my point was, I wouldn't do it if this if that was the case. Like, he was also recommended in the film not to do it. It's just... But in the other case where it's painless, I think that's, that's a much easier decision to make. And where they have the nice um, vaporization transition effects. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd want lots of uh, special effects. Okay. Anytime you go into a cloning machine or a transportation machine here on earth i want like lots of sparking and smoke yeah, it looks yeah, like it's kind of like thrown together but it's actually not it works perfectly and a robotic it's... version of tesla there play, play yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly it's like in back to the future when uh you have to like run out into the storm and get the lightning to strike and just as it yeah. does you get the two cables together frankenstein uh, yeah <laughs> frankenstein-esque all right, so let me just say what I was trying to say earlier when I went off the rails. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Douglas Hofstadter is a philosopher of some description. Um, and he like kind of argues, probably like your man perfect, uh, that like the idea of a self, like it isn't, we aren't actually, you know, our atoms or like it doesn't really matter that stuff all that matters is we're just like our consciousness is just a pattern of information so like i have certain uh mm -hmm. certain cycles or like brain patterns fire if i think about whatever i think about on a daily basis um and and like the the summation of that information is actually what is what is me so it doesn't matter if uh, so from in my brain it's like neurons are firing but you could in theory replace those neurons with um, dominoes on some kind of grand scale and if the same information mm -hmm. was was looping around the same cycles and there was a feedback mechanism that's that's propelling uh something forward then that for him is like then that's the same person yeah but i think there's like a, quite a bit of um idea behind that it's all just patterns like consciousness is actually patterns rather than it being the matter itself like yeah. the matter doesn't the matter doesn't matter <laughs> yeah but rather it, the way the patterns it does it in and yeah like you said you could replace anything uh like so uh, something that might might make more sense or be more relatable is if you replace every neuron with like a transistor or something yeah well yeah i mean that and that the whole idea of uploading your brain or whatever but you know if you're on silicon instead of carbon um but Hofstadter then has has the the idea that he so his wife died and then he argues that by him he knew her so well and he knew how she thinks but if he was um, like going down the road or something and he saw flowers that she liked and he uh, like recognized that and had a similar thought that she had kind of vocalized a lot and then that he took that kind of absorbed that. He was arguing that that's like a low resolution version of her, like not like an actual, like not her in his brain, but it's just like, a, like that's more, um, that's a piece of her consciousness that appears to him more, much more, more saliently than if it was like the same atoms were in the same place. But I was just arguing then that when I was like 12, like my brain patterns now versus when I was 12 are so disparate that, you know, there's, there's no, there's no real continuation there. And like, me and you probably think more similar, you know, or would have a similar mm. thought. Like, if we saw some physics thing, we might think the same thought about it. I can, yeah. so there's more overlap between our consciousnesses there than between me and when I was like six. Yeah. So, I mean, like, the idea of thinking about somebody else's thoughts and that kind of being a small part of them or something is, it's kind of just like one, like, if you've got one mesh of patterns and another mesh of patterns and they bump into each other and it affects the other. So it kind of is like just that that small pattern is still within you. Um, yeah. So that makes sense. And it also makes sense that like people who are in the same field, say job or whatever, um, 
would have similar patterns uh, essentially dictating their behavior, right? It's kind of like builds up from there. But if you're, say, exam- for example, in physics, if you're trained to like look at a plot um, or yeah. I don't know, something like that and draw conclusions from it, then somebody else who's trained similarly is essentially just like training the pattern in your brain, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, you're just kind of, yeah, digging the same grooves, the same channels to be passed, to, to go down. Um, there's one other thing I want to say, which mm-hmm. was an experiment that came across. I can't, I don't have the details in front of me, but basically two hemispheres that, of the brain are not connected except just at the base of some brain part. And this can get severed in like some rare cases. And then experiments can be done to show that. So then the two halves of the hemispheres of the brain aren't communicating with each other. And okay. through experiment, they see that the two hemispheres are thinking independently. And there's effectively two selves in those hemispheres. So when and, they... Uh, does well, this happen because of like like some accident that severs some part of their brain or like what? Yeah, so it was a re- like it would be originally through that, yeah. Um, okay. Or else I think there was one case that it was it was st- snipped because it in an operation because it uh, cured epilepsy or some kind of seizures. Yeah. Um, but then they would ask somebody a question and like someone's uh, like right hand and their left hand would give different answers and the person wouldn't be aware of this whole situation. It actually, this is probably a good um, little, little titillating dusting of it and I'll actually find all the details and we'll talk about it another time. But it was really cool and it was like, holy shit, so we're not just a unified self that, you know, you can have like, the idea. It really just, yeah, kind of throws it to the... That's That's weird though. Like, I mean, is it actually two selves or is it just like nerve impulses acting separately you know yeah well i mean if you lost half your brain you would still say the half that's left is you but why yeah. not that the half that's gone was you you know i mean you could you could yeah probably, you're running running into I some mean, problems there we've solved it send half your brain to Paris, half of it here <laughs> <laughs> yeah that kind of reminds me of well also the person when they were making the hand signals were they only aware of one of the hand signals or just didn't think, that, you know, so how they does that work? were just applying <laughs> it on, on um, grounds that, that weren't, so they like came up with a backstory for why they picked one over the other or whatever. But look, I, I don't know. I'll have to yeah. dig it out. It was like in a book I read a, a couple of months ago. Just get um, some psychologist on the podcast, maybe. Yeah. Some, yeah. Or neuroscientist. Any neuroscientists yeah. out there that want to come on our podcast, let us know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that kind of reminds me of that. Um, you know that ghost arm experiment where people put their arm under the table and then they put a fake arm on top of the table, but it's kind of very close, so it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, and then yeah. and then they go to like stab the, the fake arm, but the yeah. people feel it even though it's not their arm. <laughs> yeah, that's really easy to do and 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 fun. Yeah, not really related, but it just reminded me of that. Uh, But it kind of is because it's the extension of yourself and it's where you, like you're having the sensations and feelings of something that's not attached to you. And the other part of that is if you click your fingers, like you can, you know, you're actually seeing that before you're feeling it because light is traveling faster into your eyes through the optic nerve than it is up your arm. So, you know, it's just weird that... What's that time difference? (laughs) Yeah, but it's probably like a millisecond or something but like it's just that the information isn't getting integrated all in one place like in the now like things are being fed into your brain at different places at different times like and it doesn't actually come together in one neat little uh, yeah well definitely your brain is just like trained to blur all that out though because like if that was the case everybody just go insane (laughs) yeah i mean i love finding that the point again my finding my blind spot and my eyes and been like oh my god yeah that's so satisfying i don't know why that's so satisfying sometimes i catch it by accident i'm like wow i can't see that thing slightly to the right of me (laughs) because there's a thing i saw on reddit that really fucking kept me up at night it was like uh, if you close both your eyes you see black but how come if you close one eye you don't see half black and i was like (laughs) that's so annoying you don't it's just and it's like that's funny because like i haven't i didn't see that but I've thought that since I was about nine years old. Like, how does that even work? Yeah, your brain's just like, ah, this is useless. Let's just turn this off. 
yeah, like it just looks like it just kind of makes up for it. You miss a bit of vision, but you just don't see where where is the rest. Of, I'm doing it right now, but I just can't see black. Yeah, this is a good place to call it because um, we're starting to wade into the place where we're talking that stuff beyond our pay grade or uh, yeah, <laughs> wondering, yeah, yeah. research uh, effectively. I found out the word for that actually recently: ultra crepidarianism. Where you talk oh, about good. things well beyond your expertise. <laughs> And knowledge be. So, that would have been a good name for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>